Good morning and a very warm welcome here to the final day of the World Health Summit and an extra warm welcome to all of you who are here because there is always something about the last morning of the last day that means that the folks that are here uh, assembled, uh, assembled early um, are just that extra bit special. So thank you all for being here. Uh, a special thank you to those who have already attended uh, breakfast, uh, breakfast uh, meetings. My name is Sharon Pickering. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Monash University, and I could not be prouder um, of our university in hosting with our brilliant partners from other universities and other collaborating partners, include, uh, including um, Vic Health, uh, to be able uh, to convene this summit uh, here in Melbourne. Uh, the buzz has been absolutely uh, fabulous uh, and it's wonderful to have you here. But we are indeed gathered here on the unceded lands of the people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to Elders past and present and I particularly extend those respects uh, to Elders um, here today um, uh, joining uh, with us. And uh, I also want to recognise what a really significant contribution First Nations Voices have made to the program here at the World, World Health Summit. Today, just in case some of you are lost uh, and aren't sure uh, the session you're at, we are now focusing our minds on one of the thorniest parts of global health, and that is geopolitics and health, and how indeed do we achieve health equity in a divided uh, world. We meet here in Melbourne uh, at a time of rising conflict and tensions around our world. The global health challenges that we ordinarily experience are being well exacerbated as we speak by conflicts and instability undermining healthcare systems and creating health emergencies. The geopolitical tensions among states within and beyond regions is complicating and in some cases actively preventing the collaboration between states that we desperately need to address global health problems. Geopolitics is being played out on the absence of health care for so many people. How we move towards a model that can better support action to address global health challenges within the geopolitical uh, environment uh, we exist in, how we better support local empowerment to ensure community voices are heard, and how we go about supporting the alignment of all needs more closely um, is what we are here to talk about this morning. As we mentioned at the opening address, this is complex. It's really complicated. It requires all kinds of facing up to realities, messiness, um, an ability to work in circumstances that no one would ever uh, choose um, uh, among many choices. To understand how best we can not only uh, dimension this problem, but importantly, try to solve it, we are joined by a most distinguished panel who will draw on their considerable experience and insights to shape this conversation. The good woman to my right needs very little introduction to this room, but allow me to introduce the Right Honourable Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and former Administrator of the United Nations Development Program. In 2020, she was appointed the co-chair of the WHO's uh, Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response that reported in 2021. She is a strong and steady voice for sustainable development, climate action, gender equality and women's leadership, peace and justice and global health, and is an enormously generous leader and contributor. Please offer a round of applause for Helen Foss. I am particularly pleased to introduce uh, Zor Wei So, the Minister for Health and Education in the National Unity Government of Myanmar. Uh, I say this because 
some 24 years ago as a very young researcher, um, back in the days where research grants just, I know research grants don't go far enough today, I can promise you they didn't go very far 24 years ago. Uh, but because the Sydney Olympics was on, it meant we got a lot of really cheap flights out of Australia. And I was part of a major Amnesty International study that had me located on what was then known as the Thai-Burma border. My time there fundamentally shaped who I was as a researcher and in many other, and then in many other ways. And so it's wonderful to have Zor here today. He is indeed an orthopaedic surgeon, has played a leading role in Myanmar's COVID-19 fight um, as the vice chair of the COVID-19 Contained Control and Treating Coordination Committee. And he's a former rector of Myanmar's University of Medicine. Welcome, Zor. Uh, and I am also delighted to welcome Professor Esperanza Martinez, who leads the Australian National University's work on health and human security. A medical doctor by training and general surgeon with over 20 years of work in the humanitarian sector, she has spent the last eight years in Geneva with the International Committee of the Red Cross, the organisation mandated to assist and protect people affected by war and armed conflict. She led the ICRC's global health programs, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the humanitarian humanitarian response in Ukraine, among others. It is absolutely fantastic to have your experience here today on the pa panel. Esperanza, please welcome Esperanza. Uh, colleagues, faced with the option of our panel members coming and speaking to you from the lectern today, they unanimously and loudly said, oh, I don't think so. They said there is much to be in conversation about. And so it has been determined by this most formidable panel that today we will be in conversation. So just permit me a moment to relocate myself to my seat and we will get underway. Colleagues, a very warm welcome from me and from everyone here in the room, uh, in the room uh, this morning who are so looking forward to everything that you have to say. I made reference before to positioning us in the moment we are currently in. It is a very difficult moment uh, for our world, uh, worsening levels of conflict and tension, and this is directly affecting uh, global health. Let us begin by asking each of you to reflect on your own perspective of um, the current geopolitical circumstances. And I'm going to start with, in essence, the moment of, of doom. Your fears for the current moment, what it actually represents, what we need indeed to be paying attention to, to understand what's going on, but particularly what directions we might take. Helen, may I turn first uh, to you? Well, thank you, Sharon, and good morning, everyone. We are at a particular moment in time that has many labels. Some call it a syndemic of issues coming at us. Some refer to a poly crisis, whatever. There's a lot going on, and, and it all impacts on health. If we go back to, was it the, the visionary declaration of WHO back to Almaty? Uh, you know, what is health? It is a state of overall mental and physical well-being. Uh, predicated uh, on having uh, access to sufficient income, decent housing, education, clean water and environment, and a state of peace. And it doesn't take a moment's reflection to, to work out that many people don't enjoy those uh, preconditions for a state of overall uh, uh, health and, and well-being. So at the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child health, uh, whose board I chair, uh, we coined a phrase to sort of sum up what was impacting the, the lives of those we advocate for, women, children, and adolescents, but it, it can be used really to describe the impact on, on uh, all demographics. And that is the, the three Cs, COVID, climate, conflict taken together. Uh, having huge impacts on, on health and, and well-being. 
And of course, COVID has had a, a, a very long tail. If you're one of the, the girl children who never got back to school that when schools closed um, in the, the eye of the storm of the pandemic back in 2020, and, and your life went on a course of, in effect, early forced marriage and childbearing, you know, what second chance do you have in, in many societies? In, in some, not, not so many. Uh, we look at the, the long tail uh, with respect to uh, the, the poverty impact. You know, poverty went up for the first time this century uh, during the pandemic. Hunger levels soared. The, the former head of the World Food Programme began talking about biblical levels of famine. I mean, it, it, it uh, of course, wasn't good at all for women. Uh, domestic violence, also clearly very harmful to help, health. And then for, for women in the formal sector, uh, women are disproportionately uh, numbered in the services sector, particularly hospitality and retail. And sectors like this took a, a, a big uh, hit uh, during the pandemic. Again, you know, income, pretty important level of health. Um, and, and, and so you go on, in many impacts and a long uh, tail including on social cohesion, we became much more fractured societies as the debate about how we managed pandemics went, uh, went on and, of course, the anti-vaccine movement as well. So all of that was rumbling. Then on the climate health impacts, on which there's a lot more focus now and for the first time uh, at the Conference of Parties last year in Dubai, there was a health day. And we have to stop this being more than just health wash. You know, we have to actually use the, the, the huge impact of, of what's happening to our climate on our health as a lever for trying to catalyze more action and reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and getting attention uh, to adaptation. But as the Lancet Countdown series is, is recording every year, you know, the impacts from the heat stress, the wildfires, the floodings, uh, the uh, food insecurity, the, uh, the greater uh, prevalence of the diseases borne by uh, mosquitoes and ticks as their breeding seasons expand and the height at which you, altitude at which you find uh, mosquitoes goes up and so on. So there's a lot to talk about there. And then on the conflict front, I mean, this is so devastating. And day on day in our media, we see the impacts on health. I think uh, Dr. Tedros at WHO has just done a phenomenal job day in, day out, calling out the assaults on the, the health system, uh, personnel, uh, and people of Gaza with that, that bombardment, which is systematically destroying lives, health abilities, uh, facilities, uh, health workers, along with, with, with just about everything else. But as we know, it's not only Gaza, it's, it's Sudan, it, it's, it's Ukraine, it's and, 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 it's Myanmar, where the suffering of the people from conflict is, is great. All, all of the tax on the, on the health systems, of course, flying in the face of a UN Security Council resolution, number 2286 of 2016, which condemns any attacks on health facilities, personnel working there, patients in them, and, and so on. So at this, this moment in time, you know, these three Cs continue to be a way of summing up uh, how this broader environment is Im impacting on, on global health and then there's the overlay of the populism and political systems, the use of digital media, the, the, the fakes and AI, all of it complicating what people are trying to process and digest in this very um, particular moment in, in time. I can't remember a moment like it in, in my lifetime. You know, we've been through grim times, uh, but uh, this is... Um, this is unusual, or perhaps it's the new normal, of having a lot of things coming at us at once. Thanks so much, uh, Helen. Zor, how do you see the current moment, your fears and the ways potentially through? Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> I really honour, and then, uh, you know, uh, from the... I mean, I'm a man in the conflict, and it really honour to be here, and then also talk about the geopolitics, because I'm in the politics now. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I myself actually not politician. I'm orthopedic surgeon. And uh, I operated the 
Aung San Suu Kyi, and I also operated the senior general Tanshui family. I mean, a military family. I'm in the middle. But when there is a military coup, where you want to stand? Where you have to stand? You would like to stand with military, or you would like to stand with the people? That's why I'm in the politics. But uh, why we are talking about politics? I would like to show the sum of the map, because today we are talking about the geopolitics. I, I don't know. You know where, where Myanmar is? And also geopolitics in the Myanmar. And I just like to compare the uh, geopolitics in the war. And uh, uh, as uh, Helen said, 3C, actually all 3C in Myanmar, COVID-19 and climate. Recently, I don't know you were there, 2023, we have Cyclone Mocha hit a lot. The same thing, Cyclone Nargis, that was 2008, killed a lot of people. 200,000 people killed in Myanmar and also conflicts now with the democratization, autocrat and democrat and dictatorship and then, you know, democracy and federalism. Yeah, I think now you know Myanmar, where is? And, uh, you know, between the big India, I would like to start with India because population in India is now more than China. I think you all wear that. And also China. If you look at the Saudi Asia, very few countries have democratization. I mean, maybe one or two. But Myanmar, you know, being in the dictatorship, socialist, and then also autocracy, military for 70 years. We are fighting to get that democracy because Myanmar is a very much diverse country. 135 tribes, 100 dialects. That's why, actually, before we are having a, a independent from the uh, British, we are British colony, and uh, we all agree, all the ethnic groups agree, and then also to have uh, federalism like your country, Australia, and democracy. But that never happened because of the military and because of the socialist and because of the dictatorship. This is the, uh, this is the geopolitic interest of the India to Myanmar. Because the inland India, the, they call seven sister, inland India, there's a way out to Indian Ocean, Bio Bengal, only 200 kilometer. There's a Kaledon River. That river inside the Myanmar. India has interest in Myanmar. This is geopolitical interest. And this is geopolitical interest of the China. Because if China, now they have a pipeline, they bought the, uh, they buy the uh, fuel and then send through that pipeline to the Yunnan, and they don't need to go around the 4,000 miles across the, you know, into China. That is the, the interest. This is the back door of the China to the ocean, Indian Ocean, and then, you know, middle, a, a, a other area. This is also geopolitical. That geopolitical interest is, I mean, if you look at the other way, that's good. But for the conflicts, not good, you know? And then also, as uh, uh, Ellen said, the war now, there's a, a lot of competition. Like this one. China, one road, one bell for the, the whole globe. At the same time, I think U.S. have pivot to Asia. And uh, G7 had a build back better war. But that is fair competition. That competition affect on Myanmar. That competition affect on us, affect on all, all of us, 
all these conflicts in Ukraine, and then, you know, Hamas, and then now Israel and Iran. I think uh, th that is geopolitical. But actually, I'm not Bolivian. I don't know about that much. I will stop there. And then, uh, with that, actually, we are having a lot impact on her. In Myanmar, we are about to eradicate the malaria. But because of this conflict, malaria surge because people are moving to the jungle. I myself, I'm displaced. My family displaced. They burned my house, and then they tried to kill me, and they tried to arrest me. Altogether, 110 doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers have been killed in the last three years. And then uh, we move. That's why, you know, malaria, and I would really worry about TB, HIV, and then also, uh, Vaccination. I really very much concern about my country and also kids in Myanmar. Because of the COVID, because of the coup. Almost four years now, only 20, 30 percent of the children had vaccination. 70, 80 percent of the children without having immunization for four years. I will stop here. Maybe we have to find a solution. Thank you. Thank you, Zor. That is a, just a terrific way to pull this discussion into the very direct context in which you're working. Esperanza, tell us what you see in the current moment that we are in. Thank you very much. And I think we are all going to coincide on the same points, which basically shows that we know what the problem is, and then we need to think about what do we do about it. Um, and this element of the confluence of crisis. So I'm really worried about the three C's that you, um, Helen, referred to, because actually our systems are geared to deal with individual issues, sectorial, our own work. We deal with health, we deal with epidemiology, we deal with housing. So we are geared to, as humanity actually, to deal with individual issues. We are really not very adept at managing uncertainty. And I think when you have this confluence of crisis, it's like when you have pebbles thrown in the water. If it's one or two, you have ripples. If you have many, you have basically turbulence and clarity. And you, Helen, referred to, is this the new normal? I think it is. We really need to get used to the fact that we will need to factor in multi multiple issues at once to try to advance change. So I think that is going to stay with us. We have the aftermath of COVID, but we are wholly unprepared for the next pandemic. And it's not only because we don't have a pandemic treaty yet or because maybe what is agreed is only a framework, but it's also because we haven't advanced on the basic essential services that community needs. There are many communities that still lack water, still lack food, and the Ukraine and Russia conflict has been extremely harmful in that regard. So I think we need to really focus on the basics and to be able to move forward on the most, more complex issues. So I think that's the first one in relation to this confluence of the three Cs, plus, 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 because I think if we put them all together, there are many. The second issue is bringing a little bit of dimension to this element of armed conflict. I mean. It is very easy for us to ignore what's happening um, or, or pretend or think that it's only Gaza, it's only Ukraine, maybe Yemen, maybe Sudan. The latest estimate is that we have 120 armed conflicts in the world today involving 60 states. 60 states is one third of the countries of this world. So armed conflict is at its highest since the 90s and the trend continues to grow. If we look at the tensions in the Middle East, it's just really simmering. If we look at the South China Sea, there are a lot of geopolitical tensions where even a mistake can result in a deterioration of a military nature. So I think when we look at the progression of armed conflict, it's something that is not out there. It's actually a reality for many of us. Um, and the last point I want to say, uh, which really worries me is the polarization we are experiencing. 
because in the middle of the polarization, we see that at very high level, we see that polarization in the UN Security Council when they have to pass resolutions on major humanitarian issues, involving many of them armed conflict. We see that when trying to reach consensus, for example, on a pandemic treaty. But we see that in our societies as well, where we actually take sides where I don't agree with what the other says, and I want to cancel what the other says. So I think we have all of these layers of polarization that we will need to really think, what do we do about it? And you, um, Helen, referred to social cohesion. And at the end of the day, we are really going to come to have to work on that. Because we cannot change the top unless we change the bottom. And the bottom in terms of divisions and polarization and social cohesion is something that we must address as a priority. So let me, folks, I want you to know we're going off script already. <laughs> so tell me then, if I look at, if I hear what you're saying there, Esperanza, and I use that with our other panelists to go back, if we actually believe the way to deal with a confluence of crisis is to go back to the basics, how does that look different to the way we're currently trying to contend with the fragility of the public health system, or the, 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 the global health systems that we are contending with? How will that look different, Helen, if we say we've got to get these basics right in this time of poly crisis? How will it look any different to what we are doing now? <clears throat> Well, the, the challenge is to make it look different, isn't it? When you have um, so many malign forces uh, challenging the sort of vision we would probably all share for a world that was more inclusive, didn't leave people behind, where people could live in peace, enjoy access to the, you know, the, the basic and essential services of of life. But you know, not everyone out there is committed to that. I mean. A colleague from Myanmar, I mean, you know, Myanmar since independence has, for the most part, experienced the most vicious dictatorships, which have, have held the country back and, and made it one of the poorest in the world when it is so richly endowed that it, it, it could be, you know, a, a, a thriving country with, with healthy and well-educated people uh, and, and a good level of income. But it, it's politics that bedevils it. So how do you change that? Uh, really, you can only change it from the bottom up. And I think it, it's so important to be s supporting the, the kind of struggle that, that you and your colleagues in, in Myanmar are part of, because that, that dictatorship's not going to just go away because people say it's a bad thing. It, it's actually in the course of being defeated, I think. I, I, the, the level of control of the country that it's lost is quite staggering, although uh, it, it will still have air power and, and combating that is, is, is very, very difficult. But in the end, the people have to speak. Where you get change is where the people speak. I'm sounding like a song out of Les Miserables, aren't I? But <laughs> you, you can't just sit and take it. And, and in the end, a lot of people will will also be hurt in the struggle and the pushback. But what is the alternative to live under these situations forever? I mean, you know, whenever you raise the issue of Palestine, it's highly controversial. But, you know, people have been living under an occupation for decades. For decades. At some point, this becomes unbearable. You, you, you get uprisings. You know, people want dignity. They want access to the basics that make life bearable and even you know give give you hope um, so that that would be my cry support those who from the bottom up are trying to change things the people speaking mm. so if you think about the circumstances of, of, of Myanmar and you think about where people will turn their attention to where Esperanza says to where those basics would would be where do you have most hope for where they could turn that attention. Where do you see the traction coming in Myanmar in terms of those basic building blocks for dealing with the confluence of crises? Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Helen, for uh, you supporting the uh, people of Myanmar. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe maybe a little bit loud <laughs> about Myanmar. And uh, yeah, the conflicts uh, I think some evil, I, I don't know, this evil, because 
I'm thinking about the imbalance of power, imbalance of the economy, imbalance of the knowledge that we have. But we would like to have a coordinate and collaborate. But some of the evil, you cannot collaborate, you cannot cooperate. That is a problem. That is the issue in Myanmar. Because, you know, uh, we, we, we already, I mean, from the people, we would like to have a peace. That's why we would like to be together, all the ethnic group, we want to be living and, you know, having together with the federalism. I mean, uh, federal mean, you know, uh, self-determination and then autonomy that we would like to, we already. And then also we would like to have uh, democratization in the country. But that not happened because of the dictatorship. That's why we have to take the dictatorship room out. And then that, that, that has been uh, years, I think uh, you already know, we have four military coup. It's, you know, that 60, that 58 and 62 and then 88 and then now uh, uh, 2021. But this time, uh, I think people will win because all the previous military coup, they control the country within days and months, within two months. But this time, after three years, we, they are losing and now we control 70% of the territory of the country and also border area now. I think you've been in, in there, you know, Mei Hong Song, Mei Sao. Now we control that border. Uh, I think that because of the, uh, you know, bottom up, and then also because of the people moral, people will, and because of the right, human right, because we are not, we are only asking for the human, uh, the basic things of the human being. You know, that's, I think that that uh, is a solution. For that, actually, in Myanmar, uh, now, because of the, our common goal and common, you know, objectives, all the ethnic groups are united together. I have never seen, we have never seen that kind of unity among us in Myanmar. I think the same thing that we need in the war. Common go, common enemies, common, you know, infectious disease, and then diseases. Okay. I think that we can unite. I hope that we can unite, you know, with the common go and common enemy. That's why when we have been a COVID-19, I was thinking, I was thinking, oh, we, the war, we unite. All the people, we unite to fight against the, you know, COVID-19. But actually not. There's a lot of competition, passing competition. And then also after the COVID, there's a conflict, more conflicts. I don't know. I think we have to find out the solution. Uh, Esperanza, I imagine there's a whole lot of people sitting in this audience right now thinking, geez, I don't quite know how with all of my expertise and experience that myself, my teams, my organisations bring to the table, I'm not quite sure how we're going to help with an uprising, with being able to solve for some of these major um, uh, considerations in terms of what is driving conflicts uh, in, uh, in relation to the nature of many regimes and the difficulties. Sorry, Zor. Can I yeah, continue? Of course. Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, uh, no, no, please continue. And then I, I will add the sum more. Of course. No, 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 I'm very pleased to do so. It is a very real conversation here. Uh, it is... It can, for professionals and their organisations, feel very difficult. Because the sense is good public health, global health, will follow the peace. The question I'm asking you is how does good public health, how does great global health lead to the peace? And I say that as someone who spent a lot of time in Northern Ireland before the Good Friday Agreement. 
And what I saw there were many communities that recognised that when investments were made and they could see investments coming into their communities and particularly into the health of their communities, that helped lead the peace that came to be negotiated there. I would like to make sure the people in the audience have some sense of hope, <laughs> who do not sit there thinking, my goodness, we must wait for the peace for this to occur. How, does, how do all of the, this expertise here, how can help, that help drive the conditions of peace? Esperanza, and then I'll come back um, uh, to talk. You really decided to go through a very tricky situation, which is health and peace. Yes. Um, because I don't think, and I'm coming from the International Committee of the Red Cross, I don't think we should use health as a vehicle for peace. Mm -hmm. Health helps to bring the conditions in which peace happens. Because health and the health outcomes and health interventions bring people together. And healthier people actually really, really prosper, thrive. There are many studies that say that people move not only, only for conflict zones, from conflict zones, but from humanitarian settings, settings when they no longer see the future, when they no longer see how they can educate their kids and how they can access healthcare. Even food is not at the top, is healthcare and education. And today, we know, and the latest statistics say that one out of five children, so 20% of the world's children, live in armed conflict or are fleeing from armed conflict. So that is a staggering figure. So, and we have, for example, in Afghanistan, three generations that have never seen peace. So what gives me hope, and I really is a message that I would like all of us to come out of, of with here, is health is a conduit to unite people. You mentioned Northern Ireland, but we have seen this in many, many countries ravaged by war, where the Ministry of Health personnel is still operating in regular control areas, or in the middle of fighting, and they are still going with their budgets. That we are Ministry of Health, because they are trusted, because they are part of the community, and because the community trusts them. So I think we really can build on health and the health sector being a trusted voice of advice that conveys a sense of humanity. And I think when we look at these three days of conversations, I think if there is one thing that we can do moving out of here is use our voice to convey that health is not only a health sector problem, that to have healthier communities and a healthier future, we need better housing, we need better uh, infrastructure, we need better water, that our aid, Australia or any donor, that the aid that we invest takes into consideration the needs of people broader, because at the end of the day, that will be lead to a healthier future. So if we manage to convey and use our trusted voices to piece the pieces together and to actually convey a message that this is a whole of society need, I think we will be able to coalesce into something meaningful and make change. And I will just close with one point, which is that is us. But also it happens at global level. I remember briefing the UN Security Council on why we needed to vaccinate in armed conflict for COVID. And trust and access and essential services was at the very basics. The UN Security Council considered that vaccination was only, not only a moral duty, by the, and a strategic investment. So if we manage to convey the fact that having healthier communities lead us to a more prosperous society and peaceful society, that is a message that then we would like our politicians to convey and our representatives a higher level to convey as well. And Thanks, Esperanza. Uh, Zor, you wanted to contribute here, and particularly I'm interested as you, uh, as you do that in thinking about this the way that we hold the continuity of care, the provisioning of health throughout intractable conflicts and somehow how it holds that, dare I say it, some notion of impartiality, often in circumstances where nothing is impartial. Thank you very much. That's that what I'm going to see. And then also, thanks for the, you, 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 you are your vision. I mean, uh, the same. When we start, to, when you have uh, that coup, 
and then very earlier part of the coup, I, you know, uh, we, we announced the, our policy and we have a statement about the policy on humanitarian health care. We have three main policy. People first. Whoever, wherever, under the military or, you know, in the liberated area or soldiers or police or whoever, people first. Mm. This is our policy on health care and humanitarian and education. Second is transparency. Because this is people revolution. We need to be transparent and trust. Without having trust, without having transparency, you cannot get humanitarian aid. Very difficult to have health care. Because without having a trust from the patient, you cannot treat it. That's why number two is transparency. Number three, what we are saying is equivalent communication. We are saying to the UN, we are saying to the WHO, and we are saying to the UNICEF and all, you know, international uh, organization, and then, you know, government. If you communicate to the military, you have to communicate to the, I mean, revolutionary side, and ethnic people, and also, you know, a national unity government. And if you shake the hand with them, you have to shake, if you take, the, you know, discussion and then photo with them, you have to do that. Otherwise, and but that we have been saying since, uh, uh, you know, 2021, very early part of the revolution, but because of the rules and regulation and bureaucracy in the UN and WHO and all these organizations, they cannot come to the people who are suffering because they tried through the military I mean, they send the, all the aids through the Yangon and Nibiru and military that not reach to the people. And but after three years now, some of the organization, they realize that because now we control and then we give service to the people. And then I, we have a, some, one big donor. I don't want to say the name because they are, some of them are inside the, the Yangon and you know, in the military control area. Uh, the big donor, they give us uh, medicine and then equipment last year, about 10 million US dollar. We spend very well and then we manage well and then people, they got all these, you know, medicine and support. But they try through the about 100 million US dollar through the military, they cannot. And that's why now most of the organization, they understand and they are trying some through the cross border. I mean, let me uh, uh, conclude. I think people's first transparency and equivalent communication may be the same that we have to apply in the, you know, health care for the peace. That's, that's a, a really excellent uh, contribution, Zor. I mean, I think I'd be very interested, Helen, in your perspective. What's all has outlined there, the preconditions for this to work are actually often the preconditions that are absolutely absent in times of conflict. It is, you know, conflict is characterised by a deficit of trust. You know, that is, that is a, you know, a, pre, a, a precondition of the circumstances of conflict. And Zor has there signalled what then we need from external actors, uh, from... Uh, regional and global bodies and other uh, external actors to, re to reshape that. And I'd be interested in how you see them best operating in to get those preconditions in place. Well, I, I agree with Zor that if you're going to reach uh, the people of Myanmar, <laughs> about 70% of whom are living in areas that the military don't uh, control, you need to go through those who are in effective control and their organisations. And, uh, and, and there were, are quite sophisticated networks of uh, health and other uh, forms of support. So we have to you know, work, work with the reality of who's going to be able to reach people. And it won't be through uh, uh, the military uh, controlled uh, uh, channels where the money may well leach anyway. Uh, I think uh, if you're working with the 
NUG and those that it works with, there is a good commitment to accountability and transparency and to making sure that money gets to where it should uh, to help people. So I, I would really you know, advocate lateral thinking along those lines. And it's also helping to build a system for the, for the future because the reality is that in many of the areas now controlled by not the non-military forces, the health system wouldn't have been great before. And here's an opportunity to be building from the, the bottom up now. Esperanza, we see many of the uh, circumstances that are, that are emblematic of what we're talking about here occurring uh, in the midst of cross-border rivalries or indeed at the borders of many of these conflicts. And I just wonder, reflecting on your experiences in a number of places over many years, where you have seen this play out most acutely or where you have seen uh, examples that give you hope that there are ways through? I thought you were going to see examples, but not put it together with hope, because <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's very difficult. Um, I, uh, before I go into that, I really would like to pick up a little bit on the point that was discussed before, and it's the element of wars and armed conflict generally happen in resource-rich settings. Diamonds, oil, uh, I mean, you, as all, you really illustrated very well what the geopolitical interests are. And I think recognize, recognizing those openly is important. Why are states vested in one conflict or the other? Because that allows them to open to more open discussions. I think one trend that I see very worrying at the moment is the fact that many of the uh, geopolitical tensions that we are experiencing are putting into question democratic systems and say, is democracy the right way to go? Is this democracy and democratic uh, systems, including health systems as they are structured today, and the governance that we have, the right one? And I think we do have the right level of governance and the right level of structures. The issue we have is that they are not delivering adequately. So it's not that we, democracy doesn't work, but if democracies are played around just to continue to have someone in power, under the, the, the pretend that communities want that leader in power. Manipulation of democracy is very dangerous. Um, and I think so when I move from the global to the local level is really trying to have all these systems under promising and over delivering. And at the moment, they are over-promising and under-delivering very often. So I think we need to, to make sure that it's very damaging when, when trust is broken. And, and when basically those elements that we want to preserve for the future are actually being eroded. Now, the issue of cross-border and how do we move forward in, in situations that are extremely delicate, it runs again into the structures we have. We do have states with borders. And then, so how do you enter into another, another state without their permission? Um, it's a very sensitive question, and it's a question that raises a lot of, uh, opens a Pandora box in relation to sovereignty, in relation to uh, autodetermination or self-determination of nations. Um, but I think those are discussions, and Helly, you probably are better placed and so to, to, to deal with this, um, in the sense that those are discussions that generally do not happen because they are too sensitive. And I wonder if at this stage there are such things as too sensitive when we are looking at the survival of, of us and our planet uh, moving forward. So Helen, how do we get to have those discussions? How do we get to go into those areas that have been out of bounds, that have been considered too sensitive when we think about the failure to deliver, the difficulty of, of being actually able um, uh, to not overpromise and under uh, and under deliver. What are the ways in which we can have those conversations that allow us to identify where we need to go and and how we need to get there? Well, firstly, I think you know, being in close contact with the people on the ground who actually know what's happening. There's always trusted local actors, uh, and 
you know, f first principle in trying to help is do no harm. Uh, so work with those who, who know what the situation is and what the best way of getting, getting through is. It leads me to make a, another point, though, uh, and it, it's one where a state may not be in, in conflict, but it's quite fragile. That systems are fr fragile. And what we can often see there is that those who come in to help create parallel systems when the state actually needs the support to build its own systems. And uh, you know, I can think of a, a, a health minister in a, a country with you know, not strong governance, not so far from here, who, who once said to me, uh, you know, I have no idea where the donor money coming into my country's health system is going, because it never comes near the Ministry of Health and the Public Health Services. It goes to NGOs and, and often you know, a lot connected with the country giving the money. Uh, so, you know, on the basis of doing no harm, if we're putting money in, we need to be uh, supporting countries to build their, their capacity. What do they need to build their capacity and, and get this right? So it's a, it's a bit different from the, the situation in conflict where you have parallel authorities that, that need to be supported and hopefully one day as in Myanmar will, will be the, the, the authority and will have systems to, to show from the investment that's being made uh, now behind the lines as it were. But uh, I'm, I'm very opposed to uh, going behind the backs of the poor but fragile states who need uh, support with building capacities for systems, and that would go across health, education, all, all kinds of things, because you know, often people say, well, where'd all the donor money go? Well, you know, a lot of it just went into parallel systems that weren't sustainable and with a lot of foreign NGO base. So what we're really talking about here is a, is a fragmentation of, of sorts, and sometimes by necessity, but sometimes to move into these ways of, um, of operating that then become very difficult to haul back in. How do we address this? Zor, so what's been your experience of thinking about you know, parallel systems or fragmented systems around global health and the way that we can potentially pull them back together? Yeah. and. Uh the same thing, uh, I'm comparing Myanmar and then uh, globally. Uh, 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 you know, I think the war is not ready for the poor. What I feel during this conflict, I mean, in, in, in Myanmar. Because, you know, people are suffering and we are trying, but the war not reached to there. I think we have to find a way how we can stop that, how to reach there. I think current, please forgive me, current UN and WHO and organization, all these systems are not ready for the poor and who are suffering that. That's why I think, uh, that my, my feeling, I think we have to stop and review, revise, rethink with the current you know, situation, what we have. I mean, pandemic, and also technology-wise, the, you know, revolution, industrial revolution, IT revolution. With that, actually, uh, in Myanmar, we apply that in the, this revolution. Uh, we use telemedicine. And because the military, you know, they control the, all the internets and things, but now we try to get the internet, I mean, thanks for the Starlink. And then uh, with that, actually we get connection with the hospital. I have a 77 hospital in the jungle, and then I can contact them, and then I can see the, you know, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, the broken bone, and then I ask them how to fix it, and then that we can do it. And the technology also, I think with that technology revolution, I think we have to look for the future of the global health, equity. I think all these things, I think now, uh, I think uh, we can review, revise, rethink, maybe rebuild the system. Thank you. Right. Esperanza, how do you see 
these circumstances of parallel systems and fragmentation. I'm wondering in particular how you see this role of civil society as both creating an alternative but then the ways that it can pull back to support a mainstream system that has been uh, too fragile um, to be effective by reason of conflict or otherwise. We need to resolve one, one global discussion that hasn't been resolved, and it is this between aid funding and development funding. We keep having the same conversation over and over again. And we all understand, particularly from the health sector in this comprehensive overview, that we need to build systems. You cannot keep just delivering aid forever. And if we say the economy, the global economy is challenged, there are more and more growing inequalities. There are deepening divisions between rich and poor, and there are more armed conflicts. So the situation is only going to get worse. So I think this, this dichotomy between what is humanitarian aid for today and tomorrow, and what is development, I think we need, really need to address it. Some countries have got it right, uh, but some many more, most donors don't. They do have a division. And I think investing in areas of crisis is extremely important to build the systems. That will avoid parallel systems, because then you know that you are building and contributing towards a system. That's, that's the first element, the element uh, aid, development, and system support. The second one is very often the systems don't have the community component factor in. And we saw in COVID, we really expected communities to actually communities ship in with prevention and dissemination campaigns. They were the first responders, and they are the first responders across the world. But funding doesn't get to the community level. Funding stops at an upper level. And we need to find ways of funding community efforts, of really fostering the, the work and the great work that they do. Communities know what to do. And if they, know what, they don't know what to do, they know whom to contact. But the issue very often is resourcing. And, I, and I'm not talking about only humanitarian settings. I'm talking about Australia. I'm talking about really communities across the world the most disadvantaged communities very often either don't have a seat at the table, and if they do, they have no control over the funding that comes to them. And that is an element of trust as well. We don't need communities to trust the system. We need the systems to trust the communities as well. So it goes both ways. So, Helen, you won't be surprised that I, I, I then turn back to you and I say, well, which communities, which voices? You know, uh, Zor made the comment, is the world actually really ready for the poor? You're talking about their Esperanza, not just listening to voices of communities you're giving them a seat at the table, it's actually giving them uh, key levers of control and power in the circumstances uh, in which they're existing. Helen, where has this worked? Where can it work? What are the hallmarks of it? Well, I think there's one uh, particular spectacular success in global health where communities came to drive the response, and that was in HIV. We would never have had the success we've seen in combating HIV without uh, the affected communities being very much at the centre of, of the response. I know this was true of Australia, I know it's true of my own country. Uh, you know, people uh, living with HIV, uh, men having sex with men, uh, the sex worker voice, the people who inject drug voices, to get effective responses, the, the what were always called the key populations in, in the high income countries, came to the fore to say what they wanted and to have such a significant impact on driving uh, uh, the response. Now, of course, the AIDS pandemic has, has different features in, 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 in different regions of the world as well, but we, we will never bring an end to AIDS as a public health emergency unless affected communities get to drive the response, say what their needs are, how, how the issues are best addressed. So I always take this as a, a bit of a gold standard uh, for how things can be. That's great. Mm. Zor, when you look at Myanmar, where have been, have there, well, have there been examples <clears throat> that give you this hope of how those voices can be not only at the table but can be given the resources and can be driving the change? Or can you see where that may be possible? 
Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, I'm also thinking of the uh, uh, government and people, and governance and community. Uh, because COVID first wave and second wave in Myanmar, because of the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and people, we manage very well. Myanmar is not a poor country, not much money. But COVID first wave and second wave, we control very well. I mean, because of the governance, government, and then people, community. I think the same thing that we have to apply in the war and then globally. Another thing, what I'm thinking, sorry, actually I'm a surgeon, that's why I'm thinking maybe way of the surgeon, way of thinking. Uh, surgical audit, clinical audit, that we apply in the you know, clinical management and surgical management. The same thing I would like to apply in the, this politics and healthcare. I think we need to do the global audit. I think I stopped that. <laughs> Don't worry, there's a lot of people just noting that down. It'll be in a lot of grant applications going forward. Uh, Esperanza, you bring an enormous amount of experience from the field. When you look back and you think about, I'm going to ask you to go uh, to, the, to, the, to the regrets, if you like. Where could this have happened and it didn't? Where has there been an opportunity to do this and we haven't taken it as a world, as a particular place in the world? Where have you seen over your time in the field where it, a series of key decisions and impetus and injection of resourcing, a trust could have made a difference and got a different outcome? Um, I will go back to the World Health Humanitarian Summit of 2016 and the conversation on localization. I think we really miss the opportunity of moving the conversation from, oh, we will transfer the money to local actors, to moving the conversation to this is community-led, community-owned and community-led. We missed it as global community across the world. And we are now, very often we refrain from saying localization and we say community-led and community-owned. But this is many years after. We are eight years after. So I think that was a big miss. Um, now, not too late though. I mean, if we heard anything, and I really, really like all the, the diversity of voices that we have had in this, having the summit, Traditional owners of the land, Aboriginal communities, they lived in communion with the environment. We're talking about one health, we are talking about mental health, environmental health, water, air, earth, everything. They do have the knowledge. So it's how do we actually allow that knowledge to guide us? Because we, in the Western approach, we have got lost. I mean, if we look at the three C's, we are in a, in a compounded crisis situation where clearly a lot of the things we are doing are not yielding the results we should have. So I think it's that element of really, really honoring the community own. Um, and I think that's a big thing we actually missed, in my view. So Helen, let's, let's just propel ourselves forward. Let's make an assumption that we can get localization right through community-led, community-owned, listening to voices, getting them aligned, making sure they're appropriately well-resourced. How do you then go from that into, or how do you systematize that, realize that to get the kinds of systems reform that move us away from that fragmentation from those trust deficits, from the over-promising and under-delivering? Well, I, I think what Esperanza is describing is building a system from the bottom up, uh, which is more likely to be sustainable. And as you, as you build from the, the bottom up, you know, there, there will be structures of the state at the local, the regional, the national level, uh, which, which will also be relating to that. So I think if, if you're building from that bottom level, you will, in the end, end up reinforcing the, the ability of a, of a nation to govern its own responses, run its own, own responses. 
so I, I don't think it's, it's incompatible with you know, this notion of, of building systems. I think you're putting in place the foundations of the system. And I agree with you, Esperanza, about how this would have been a more helpful way to conceptualize that 2016 World Humanitarian Summit held in, in Istanbul, which, which, which I was at. Um, I mean, you know, the big organizations, they do have a lot of trouble giving up control. Right? Um, and, 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 and still, I think with the, the way that the localization was being conceptualized, they kept a lot of control. They have to be prepared to hand over control. You know, by all means, help mobilize the money and bring it in, but then the, the trusted actors have to step forward and, and, and their empowerment becomes really critical. So what you're pointing to there... Oh, sorry, I forgot the microphone. Because we're just having a conversation here and you just all happen to be here. <laughs> what you signal there, Helen, is actually really hard. It's really hard. So in your experience, Esperanza, in your experience, how do we make that less hard? for organisations to still feel they're operating with the requisite levels of, let me say, uh, accountability, oversight, engagement, joining the dots that are actually critical to their existence, yet at the same time, let go of some of, of, of that. And in so doing, risk failure. Mm -hmm. Esperanza Zor, where do you see that having um, shown its way to success? Because that, what, what Helen is saying there is, I, I think it would be hard to disagree with, but how, do, how is it actually done in practice? You first. Lady. Thank you. I am very fond of a two-loop um, description of when a system needs reform and change and a new one is emerging. The old system has a lot of pressures to survive and to continue as it is. And the only, the only way a new system emerge is really by coalescing pockets of change. So the way to go and, and the way we need to do it is really to start to really coalesce the good examples that we have. Community to community. Yesterday we heard Sid Michael Marmot. One city changed and then the other one wants to change and then the other one and there is a county and there is a country and there may be a coalition of countries. So it's really to find those pockets of change that actually are making a difference and coalesce with others. And then it might be a clinical practitioner working with the community. Well, asking the question, am I serving all the members of the community or are there segments of the community that are not accessing the services? And work on that. Or having a conversation with the mayor and saying, can we do something about walking in this city? Because it's just not good what we have. So it's really finding the spaces where we can influence and coalesce with another. Because if we coalesce and change happen, it will be an impetus, an impetus and an energy that will keep growing. So it's not impossible, but it requires to find out what is it that I, at my level, can do? And who do I partner with to do it? Because that is an element of change. So what's your view into this? Yeah. Uh I, I, I'm thinking of the individual and also individual country and then also region. I think I agree, totally agree with Helen. Bottom up, I think very important. Bottom up approach. And I would say that federalization of federalism self-determination. People want self-determination. Country wants self-determination. Region wants it. I think autonomy. Everybody wants autonomy. I think with that, we have to find out the solution in the war. That kinds of, I don't know how you say that the words, federalization or bottom up. I think uh, 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 self-determination, autonomy, and listening to the people, listening to the community, listening to the country. I think that is very important. With that, 
I don't know, uh, democratization, democracy, health care, maybe which one is first? Federal and democracy, I don't know which one is first. I think uh, that we need to apply in the war, in the future health care. Thank you. Thank you. So, Helen, I think uh, there are very points, various points when you gather brilliant people in a room from around the world and things emerge. And colleagues, if you missed this in the discussion we just had, can I just say in coalescing pockets of change is, is something that I ask you to take away from this summit into all of the work uh, that you do and you lead uh, uh, going, uh, going forward. And so I think there are so many people in this room who have been deeply committed to, uh, uh, who have been part of, who have supported, who have uh, enabled that kind of bottom-up work, who have a deep and abiding commitment to self-determination. But, geez, there's a lot of work going on out in the world, and to think that we're starting from scratch every single time feels a little bit limiting, given the scale of the problems that are being, that are being faced. Helen, how do we ensure we're not starting from, from ground zero every time? How do we coalesce the pockets of change? How do we make sure that the people in this audience don't go out of here with slumped shoulders thinking, geez, I'm starting from scratch every single time? How, when we turn to communities and how, when communities turn to themselves, can we be sure they're not starting from ground zero every time? Well, I, I think for, for those who are in the, the business of mobilising resources to support in complex situations, it's, it's a question of uh, continual learning, isn't it? Always wanting to improve and as Esperanza says, where there are those emerging best practices, you know, make them the, the way that you operate. You know, we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. We do, we do see what works, and we have to be big enough to say if the way we were working actually wasn't that effective, but there's other ways, and learn from each other. And this applies, you know, across the big uh, multilateral organisations, the, the Red Cross movement, the major international NGOs and so on. Learn from best practice and, and, then, and then apply it. So it requires leadership to come along, it requires the, those who are working at the, with, with those at the local level to be feeding the lessons back up so that it informs better practice for the future. But we don't need to start from scratch all the time. We can, we can take on board the lessons of what's worked. Esperanza earlier in our conversations referenced that a third of the world's countries are engaged in some form of conflict uh, at the moment and so no one here needs to speak to communities there around the impact of geopolitics on public health and on the continuity of care and quality of, of, of health care that they are, able to, uh, they are able to access and the difference that made, it makes in their lives. For two-thirds of the world's countries that aren't inv involved in conflict, of course, the geopolitics of health was driven home by the pandemic and indeed by um, the race for vaccination and the availability of vaccinations. And so you made uh, comments there, particularly um, in relation uh, to, to children. It would be remiss of us as part of this discussion if not to reflect on out of that experience, what have we learned that we can take forward most acutely? What do we need to not let go of from that experience? Helen? Well, I think for me, the geopolitics around the pandemic uh, can be put into two baskets, if you like. The first was uh, the way it intensified US-China contestation. Um, it, it's interesting to think back to the month of January in 2020, when initially President Trump, experience one would not want to repeat, but uh, President Trump, he, he initially started saying, oh, you know, I've spoken to President Xi and his people are suffering in Wuhan and so on, until someone must have said to him, you know, there's some real political opportunities here. And almost on a dime, it pivoted to uh, Trump attacking China and weaponizing 
the fact that the virus had emerged uh, in, in China, in, in Wuhan, um, and that then bedeviled effective responses at the Security Council level, because when there were attempts to you know, get the Security Council in behind mobilizing all possible means to fight COVID, uh, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, had tried to insist on wording about the Wuhan virus. Well, clearly that was never going to go, to, to go down. Um, look, you know, I spent the best part of a year with the uh, inquiry mandated by the World Health Assembly looking at what had happened. And, and we're under no doubt that China could have been more transparent earlier. And that, that was a barrier. Uh, to, to getting a, a, a strong and effective uh, response, uh, particularly in that first month. Um, but, you know, the, the geopolitics were very, very unhelpful to that. Okay, so then fast forward to, uh, you have the full-blown uh, pandemic, uh, clearly evident to all by March. And the search for the vaccine goes on, search for what therapeutics might work, uh, there was inequity written all over this from the very beginning. Uh, there were many countries who didn't have enough oxygen, they didn't have enough masks, they didn't have the lab structure to you know, be testing uh, what was happening, they couldn't access the testing kits, and then when the vaccines and the therapeutics came along, they couldn't get those over either. And the geopolitics of this have been to greatly intensify ill-feeling between broadly North and South because the North got stuff first and hung on to it and looked after itself, regardless of the mantra that we're all in this together, we looked after ourselves. And others, you know, I'm, I'm sure in Myanmar today, or there'll be even health workers who've never had as much as a single shot of a COVID vaccine, let alone people having access to Paxlovid. And, and so the ill feeling around this, of course, has then moved in to uh, influence the discussions around the pandemic accord. And the pandemic accord, if it gets some kind of outcome in the next couple of weeks, which it would need to do to present something to the World Health Assembly, it will be um, more of a headline style agreement of what I would refer to as a framework convention. It won't be called a convention because the US can't ratify conventions, I suppose. That's why the Paris Agreement's not a convention. Uh, but um, it, you know, it, it will not be able to resolve the core issues around equitable access. Uh, and, and this is so bound up with the protection of intellectual property, particularly by high-income countries, and the lack of willingness to see that in a pandemic, every possible tool must be thrown at it uh, to stop uh, the, the worst happening. I mean, reflect on the fact that we've never had a, an intellectual property waiver under the TRIPS agreement of WTO for antiretrovirals. And you got antiretrovirals out through in the end, deals with the drug companies, not through a principled approach with a waiver. Uh, so geopolitics has been all over the way this pandemic has played out from the very start, with the with the Trump people seeing the you know the possibility to weaponize this, and then with the the inequity, and the inequity between North and South uh, has has exacerbated a narrative that was already there. Uh, obviously, going back to the legacy of colonization, uh, to the way the climate crisis has, has developed, uh, where you know, the, the greatest stock of carbon in the atmosphere is there because of the industrialization of what are today's Western powers. Um, you know, there's, there's a narrative around this that says, you people never did enough to address that either, uh, and now you don't make the means available for us to do it. So in the end, everything becomes connected, the way the COVID pandemics played out with its inequities, harking back to historic inequities from, from colonization uh, to the way the, the, the climate crisis developed. And this is why it's quite difficult to get agreement on a lot of stuff these days uh, in, in international settings because there's so many overlays of, of hurt and grief and, and, and perceptions of injustice. Zor, if you were to look back at the pandemic, tell us. What were, the, what were the things that you would want to hold on to? What are the things that you saw as being most pernicious in terms of, in terms of your people? 
Sorry, pandemic? Yeah, when you look back at the, the period of the pandemic, mm -hmm. what do you see as being the, the big lessons that came from it? Uh, for, for, for me, I mean, from Myanmar, we, we, we have very difficult time. Actually, uh, uh, I think uh, I already mentioned first wave and second wave we control well, but uh, third wave and sec uh, fourth wave because of the you know military coup. Actually, I lost my mother in the third wave. Yeah. I mean, uh, that that's why I think uh, I remember you and General Secretary has been you know request. I mean, requested when very earlier part of the you know uh, pandemic, global ceasefire. He requested but not happen. And then also these things, I think all, that a lot impact to us and then, you know, COVID and coup. And uh, we lost, I, we don't know actually now, uh, until now we don't know how much people we lost in the COVID third wave. And then uh, we don't, because now we, we, we if we have, can have a census, we can know that, but otherwise we cannot. And these are the lessons that we have learned, I think, uh, with the today topics, geopolitics and health. I think we already started 2000, since, uh, you know, COVID time, and then now many people are thinking, and then this topic is also now become on the stage. Mm. I think uh, that is a lesson learned, and then now we are thinking of that for the future, I think. Uh, from. I mean, these days, I think if we work together and collaborate, I'm sure with the technology and with the collaboration, with the dialogue. Okay. Esperanza, I'll finish with you. When you look back, what have been the big lessons, the big things to repeat, the big things to leave behind from the pandemic? Uh, building on, on what Helen says, uh, the geopolitics in the production and the distribution of vaccine were just really, really strong. And the north, south, and all the different... You could almost map what country's political alliance was also by the vaccines they were acquired or able to acquire. So I think it is. it was really the linkages between political decisions and, and distribution and procurement of vaccine was really, really was very visible. However, I, I, I believe that crises are always opportunities for change. And one thing that happens with COVID was the fact that the interplay between political decisions and health became so evident that today it is much easier to have these type of conversations with policymakers and say, can we talk about the health implications of this decision? Can we actually talk about the implications of the intersection between climate, conflict, and health today? is much easier. Before the pandemic, I mean, you will have looked like, what do you mean climate and, and health? What do you mean conflict and geopolitics? So today, I think that has opened up a space where you don't need to start from scratch, trying to explain why there is an interconnection. Sadly, as, as terrible as the pandemic was, it has given all of us an awareness that we didn't have before. So that's the first element. And the second element is that there are elements of change. There were many countries in Africa, for example, that were not recording deaths, and now they are recording births and deaths, because it became so evident that this is absolutely necessary to mount a public health response. The African CDC is an extremely useful example of how a continent comes together to actually really do what is needed without waiting for others to do it. So I think we do have great examples uh, of action in the middle of a crisis that we can build upon uh, and move on and use that level of awareness to have these conversations. That is, I think, one of the most fantastic comments for us to bring our conversation to a close. Through our greatest times of crisis and conflict, we have an opportunity to change the frame, to change the way we understand, and to think that we began this conversation at the start really talking about the confluence of crises. And that indeed what the pandemic has given us is, an, is not simply an opportunity but an impetus to understand them simultaneously and to change that frame and therefore to look at the ways we operate from that community-led 
um, level all the way through to the kind of systems change and expectations at our regional and global levels. This has been... I'm glad for all of you who are able just to happen to pass by and call in on this very interesting conversation. This has been a really... Um, thought-provoking session, thanks to the incredible uh, experiences and insights that our panel has brought here today. Please join me in just offering a round of applause of thanks. If, like me, you were actually so interested in the conversation and you failed to take a few notes, let me just summarise a couple of things for you. When we think about what we face in terms of the ways that geopolitics is standing between individuals, communities and nations, and their access to healthcare, which is a defining feature of human existence and indeed of human dignity, you across this audience bring to this equation something different to many other audiences. You bring one another. In a web of connections across universities, across civil societies, across engaged governments, ways of working together to harness not only everything that you have brought to the table and everything that we have heard to hear, but to do what Esperanza has put out and called us to do to coalesce the pockets of change. Particularly as a leader of a university, believe me, people don't do things because you tell them to do them. <laughs> they do things because you show them a different future. You show them the pockets of change. All of you within this audience have heard our brilliant panel members. You all bring your own incredible experience and expertise to be able to bring about a confluence of those pockets of change. I wish you every strength in doing so, and I remind you that doing it collectively through something as wonderful as this World Health Summit that has brought you all here together in what has been gloriously sunny Melbourne and now is back to true to form today. Um, I wish you incredibly well in all of your efforts, and I thank you so much for being with us for this conversation. But before you give us that last rousing round of applause. Can I pay a particular tribute to all our panel members? But I'd actually like to pay tribute to a truly remarkable global leader in Helen Clark, who has... who has not, over so many years, offered such fine leadership from this part of the world, but to all parts of the world. But look where she's been for the last three days. Here. Great leaders are deeply collaborative and they are present. And Helen, for you to be here and to give so generously of your time speaks not only to... Um, to your leadership more generally, but to the person that embodies that leadership. And let that be an inspiration uh, to us all. We will be much better for a world full of leaders that emulate uh, Helen Clark and the Helen Clarks of this world. Uh, on behalf of this room, we thank you for your generosity. Uh, colleagues, we shall not stand between you and the remainder of your program today. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you.